I'm somewhat less um, obstructed by equipment these days. It feels good. <coughs> Everything still happens very slowly, though. Yeah, I'm accustomed to being able to get things done in seconds, not hours. <laughs> Hi. Yes. Truly a universalist crowd. <laughs> Very nice. So I, we have these principles, you know, when, when people become Unitarians, they don't adopt a creed or a doctrine or a set of dogmas. They adopt a set of principles, an agreement of how we'll be together. And we've talked about the first and second principles. The first one, you know, reminding us that every person has dignity and worth. And the second one, reminding us that we want to treat each other with compassion and be, you know, equitable in our interactions. Not necessarily the same, but equitable, right? And this third principle is taking it even one step further. It's saying we have to accept everyone as they are. Sometimes that isn't easy, right? But there's another piece to this principle that many of us overlooked, especially if we've come from a situation where we're feeling a little anti-church, and that is encourage each other's spiritual development. Now, across Unitarian Universalists, that has as many different meanings as there are people, different meanings. Everyone has a different idea of what spiritual growth and development might be. And so that makes agreeing on how we're going to help each other even more interesting. <laughs> and this idea of acceptance and the possibility of spiritual development really is the essence of universalism. So those of you who have been through the membership thing with us, you know, where we do our little quick thing in, you know, on a Sunday, um, have heard me talk about how universalism is as old as Christianity. Uh, some of the first writings that we see are from a guy named Oregon. No. <laughs> O-R-I-G-E-N. And some people pronounce it origin, but it isn't. Anyway, origin, Oregon. And in Latin, gens means man, and ore means, is from orate. So it's the speaking man. And I've often wondered if it wasn't a pseudonym. <laughs> but anyway, we have his writings. And he talks about the fact that nowhere in Jesus' teachings do we see a division of some people connecting with God and some people never, ever, ever being allowed to experience that connection. That is strange for people who grew up in a Christian environment. You know, in most Christian churches today, you know, people are told if you do not do these set of things and you do not live this particular way, you're going to spend the rest of your life separated from God in a terribly de demonic, tortuous environment. And that is nowhere in the New Testament. So, relax. You don't need salvation. You are salvation. Yes. So, as we move with this idea, of course, as the you know, Christian empire grew, the Roman church grew, and they were holding on their particular doctrine, that one kind of got faded into the background and nobody said it out loud too much if they didn't want to get burned at the stake. And so, you know, it, it was there, but it was kind of hidden for a lot of years, and it really wasn't until the U.S. was formed that it began to emerge again, and it really wasn't until the 1800s that people actually began to feel free to talk about it out loud. <sighs> yes, we're all going to be united in one divine entity that is present throughout the whole universe. Universalism. That divinity is all that is in form, that the form is divinity, and that we are part of that form, and therefore we cannot be separated, and never will be separated, and isn't that wonderful? Now there's one version of that form of universalism that says, well you might go through a short period of time where you've got to clear out all the yuck you brought with you from your body life. And in Catholicism that's called purgatory. In other places, it's you know, called different things. And what we've learned as we've looked at near-death experiences is that there actually often is that kind of time. 
And my favorite version of this is in Danny and Brinkley's Saved by the Light. Now this was a really horrid person. I mean, this was the kind of guy, this first response was to hit someone. You know, if he was upset in any way, and he was yelling at people, and he was telling them how awful they were and everything else, and then he got hit by lightning through a telephone. <laughs> when he was yelling at someone. <laughs> And when he came into awareness, he was in front of this grand, sparkly being, and he was being put through everything he'd ever done to anyone else. <laughs> With great love, but a lot of pain. And then he was told, you're not done yet, you get to go back. <laughs> so he came back, and he remembered what had happened to him, and he said, well, I better clean up my act. So he tried, with no training or education in nonviolent communication <laughs> or anything like that, to be a better human being. Guess what? He got struck by lightning again, <laughs> this time out on a roadway, and he goes to the same place, and he has that same incredibly loving experience of a lot of pain that he'd inflict on a lot of people, but this time it wasn't as intense. This time, the stuff that he had done recently actually ameliorated, re, you know, reduced the power of the negative experiences that he had been having. And he was told he had to come back again. The guy did it one more time. He's still on the planet. He's teaching this stuff. And I've forgotten what the third one was. I think he was in a car accident or something like that. Anyway, he's back there, but now he has actually become a teacher of, you don't want to be a nasty person because this is what's going to happen to you. <laughs> and so he's just built up all this good karma and all this good, wonderful stuff in his life, and he gets to go through that whole thing, but it's like a bad dream. And then he gets to experience all the wonderful experiences that people have because of who he is now. And he came back to tell the story. My favorite of all those. And that version of universalism tells us that we may have stuff to clean up. If we can get it cleaned up down here, great. Wonderful, because then we don't have to go through it again up there. And if we, or out there, or wherever there is, <laughs> which may be right here in you know, just one step of dimensions up that I can't see with my body, right? <laughs> but on that side, you know, we get to move forward from wherever we were here. And we have to clean up what was left over here in order to do that. And that's kind of cool. That's a nice version of universalism. I like that. Along about the 1920s, when, you know, after universalism as a theology had been explored for quite a while in this country, people started thinking about it as a philosophy. And part of that was because we started having all these guys coming over from India and China and a few even from Japan starting teaching us about their religious traditions and people started saying, you know, there's a lot in common across these traditions. Maybe there is a universality to spirituality. Isn't that nice? And the Hindus in particularly adopted this. My grandmother was in India during the period that the Hindus were adopting this. So as, as her daughter likes to say, she came back more Hindu than Christian because she saw the validity of something that said, we're all headed towards something, we don't know exactly what that is, but every path gets you there sooner or later. And guess what? I was eight years old the first time I heard that. And that has affected my whole life. <laughs> Which is why I consider myself an interfaith minister. Yeah. Every path gets you there. Sometimes it looks like you're going downhill. And sometimes it looks like you're up here and someone else is down here. But guess what? <laughs> That's bound to happen that you trade places. Because the paths are not direct. Life, as I like to say, is a sine wave. And I'm not going to always be going up in a continuous line on any dimension of my life or in any aspect of my life. So if I'm in the presence of someone who is on their path, I better not make any assumptions about where they are on the mountain. <laughs> 
because where we are relative to each other is almost impossible to measure. Right? I need to look where I am. And if they ask, mm -hmm. share perhaps some of my experiences and understandings on the off chance that perhaps it will help them move a little forward on their path. So universalism now is not just that no one is left out of this journey, but that all the different paths are one universal process. Well, as humanism emerged in the 40s, Aldous Huxley wrote a book called Perennial Philosophy, and I've talked about it here a couple of times. If you haven't read it and you're interested in this stuff, I strongly recommend it. And if you don't want to read a whole book, get a copy of Bhagavad Gita, just read the introduction. It's the same material, <laughs> the <laughs> Penguin version. But Huxley was looking at these things as if there is a universal, you know, something, quality to all these religions, and he's talking about the eight major big civilization religions, he says there must be something core that, that we can talk about, and that core is what he calls the perennial, basically the all the years philosophy. It's present in all times, in all places. There are core assumptions, and one of them is that there is a universal something of which we are a part. We don't know what it is. We can't name it. Everybody's got a different name according to their culture and language. And that's the only difference, is the culture and language. And everyone has a different process according to their culture and, again, their language for how to experience that unnameable, unfully knowable, but at least experienceable universalness. Universalness, I like that. Universal presence, universal power, universal unfolding, whatever we call that. I think that's pretty marvelous. Each culture, each language, has their own way of describing this process. And that's really the only difference. Now, within the language and within the culture, there are traditions, and all of these major traditions, the, you know, from Taoism and Buddhism and Hinduism and forward through Islam, they all have something like scripture. And Islam being the most recent, it says, well, if you've got a sacred scripture, you're okay. So that's kind of cool. That's their notion of this universalism. Any, any people of the book, and a few months ago I talked about the expectations of people of the book, and any people of the book is okay because they understand that there is something beyond being a human being, something beyond this normal life that we need to reach for and become. Unfortunately, there's another group of people in Islam who don't buy that. <laughs> they say if you're not following the particular la laid out instructions in the Quran, you're not okay. So this is the tension within Islam that, that the whole world is wrestling with right now. Some are universalists and some aren't. Hmm could say that about Christianity, couldn't we? Could say that about Judaism, couldn't we? We couldn't say that about Taoism. It's the fundamental essence of Taoism. But there are schools of Buddhism that we could say that about, and there are schools of Hinduism we could say that about. Only the Mahayana tradition in the Buddhists, of which Zen is one expression, accept this universality, this universalism. This notion that everyone has access to divinity, whatever that may be called. Wow. So if we look at the world's civilization, religious traditions, we can see that the vast majority include the possibility of what the Unitarian Universalist Association stands for. I like that. Every, yeah, everywhere I look, I have the possibility for what we stand for. Now there is another level of universalism that isn't talked about by philosophers or theologists because it's pre-civilization. But it still exists among the shamanic people. 
among the Wiccans, among what we call the pagans and the neo-pagans, among the village people and the tribal people that have not yet given up and accepted the global culture that we call civilization. And for them, universalism means not only is there this universal presence, but that universal presence is speaking to me through every root and vine and tree, every insect, every fish, every four-legged, two-legged standing, swimming, crawling, or flying, being. Speaking to me if I listen. The still, small voice of the Judeo-Christian tradition is present everywhere in the indigenous people's world. And it's available to all beings who are willing to drop the structures of civilization, even for a moment. And I, I know that many Unitarians are aware of this because many Unitarians have a bumper sticker that says, nature is my church. Mm -hmm. And a lot of you could not live anywhere else because you don't have access to what we have access to, right? So another mode of universalism, and technically the, the anthropologists call it animism. That is that all of beingness is animated. It all has animus. It all has soul. It all has spirit. I don't think I can do much to help someone who's on that path with their spiritual development. I think I need to listen and let them help me. <laughs> yeah. To be able to feel and know the unknowable, unnameable, but ever experienceable presence in every moment, in every being. I think some of Richard's slides may have helped some of us do that today. Mm -hmm. To feel that universal process that is unfolding. So what has this got to do with where we are going as humanity? We've moved from a, from, you know, if you look at the history of humanity or in the prehistory of humanity, we've moved from an understanding that universal means everything everywhere is always wise always has intelligence, always has life, always has a soul, into a civilized notion that there is a deity, or many, and humanity, and they have the soul, and nothing else has a soul. That is what civilization says. Then we went from that into humanism, we canceled the deity. <laughs> and we said humanity is the universal constant, but nothing else has a soul. And then we started actually listening and watching and observing and loving some beings in our world. And it's amazing to me how often it takes having a pet for people to wake up to the possibility that a four-legged can have a soul. I grew up in the sciences, and when I was in high school, our, we had a lab, and we were part of Future Scientists of America, and we were doing all kinds of experiments, and one gal was over here working with uh, frogs, and a guy over here was working with mice, and it was this big deal, and I'm going, I don't want to do that. <laughs> and I didn't really register, it was because I didn't want to participate in doing anything destructive to a being with a soul. I didn't even register that's what it was. I just knew that was not my science. <laughs> and they might get great results as a result. I went off and studied fungal hyphae in the forest. <laughs> <laughs> so if we can begin to, and talk about that, I mean standing people, Right? The standing people, the tree, are talking to each other through that very fungal I think That's very cool. Anyway, <laughs> so if we understand that we've gone through this progress as humanity from knowing it's always everywhere present and that anything that shows up in my life is speaking to me and showing me where I am needing to be, that is my spiritual development, right? into this, no, you can only talk to one being, and frankly, there's only one person who can talk to that being. So you have to talk to the person who talks to the being, right? So that's civilization for 6,000 years. 
until the last 50 years. Literally, 55. 55 years. And all of a sudden, humanity is waking up to the realization that cannot be the case. There is no way we can survive on this planet if we continue to hold that. <coughs> So in the 1960s, the Unitarians, who were absolutely convinced there was only one divinity present in all things, and the Universalists who say, yes, present everywhere, and everyone gets access to that at all stages of development, including after passing, passing on, right? In or out of the body, we are a part of it. We got together, we formed this association, and proceeded to totally forget it. For the first 30 years of the Unitarian Universalist Association, it was a humanist organization which the J word, the G word, were not allowed to be said in most of the churches and fellowships. And then about 15 years ago, the association woke up and said, wait a minute, our people are getting ahead of us. <laughs> we, need to go. we need to be talking about this other stuff. And so that began to happen within Unitarian Universalism and this third principle, not just to accept each other but to encourage our spiritual growth and development, began to become a part of what this organization is about. And it has been a delight. And it's been a wonderful thing for me in this particular community because you not only grasp that, you are it. This community, I think why it feels like home for so many of us, is, oh wow, I can drop the dogma, I can drop the doctrine, I can explore, I can discover, and I can be accepted in that process. Wow. Congratulations. <laughs> so the next step in the development of humanity is more of that. And this is what I am seeing when I look around the world. Part of why I went traveling over the last year was to see if this was in place in other places. And also it's what I'm seeing as I do my research around activities and organizations and who's doing what and who's teaching what and whatever. And it, it's coming in all different ways, of course, because there's as many paths as there are people, right? But you can see it if you just scan YouTube. I scan YouTube for any spiritual idea or principle, you will see dozens of YouTubes on that subject as different people of different ages come to understand it and share their experience. Just on YouTube. Yeah? I love YouTube. <laughs> it has done more to democratize humanity than anything out there right now. It has done more to expand our access to knowledge than anything that exists or ever has existed. It is the equivalent of the Gutenberg Press. Yeah, it is amazing. So if that is the possible direction for humanity, of course there's always multiple scenarios and you know, we have many probabilities and you know, right now we're about 50-50 about the US becoming you know, something else entirely. But right now, we actually have a 30% opportunity for the whole of humanity to step into this universalist understanding, to become what we find when we're here. 30% for all of humanity. That's a pretty impressive probability. And it won't take much to tip it, especially if Rupert Sheldrake's theory of morphic resonance is accurate. And so far, every test of it has been right on. And that is, anyone, anywhere who is thinking like you are right now is now enhanced in their understanding of universalism because we just had this conversation. Well, this lecture. <laughs> but it's felt like a conversation. That's how morphic resonance works. Every time we move into our own spiritual development, we are literally encouraging, we are making it easier for people of like minds or hearts, even if their minds aren't quite lined up yet, to move in that direction. Yippee. And that, I would suggest, is a future worth living for. Thank you very much.